Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the tawfiq to continue our discussion of Surah Al-Najm. Inshallah, this will be the final session and we hope to conclude the tafsir of Surah Al-Najm and uh, go on to another surah. Now, if you look at ayah number 50, we reached ayah number 50 of the surah where Allah says, وَأَنَّهُ أَهْلَكَ عَادًا الْأُولَى And he destroyed Ad the former. Now because the ayah begins with wow, with wa, وَأَنَّهُ أَهْلَكَ عَادًا الْأُولَى It means that this is a continuation of the previous discussion whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sharing with us some of the wisdoms and some of the passages that were recorded in the scriptures of Ibrahim and Musa. Suhuf Ibrahim wa Musa, right? So continuing this discussion, and the Quran mentions the scriptures of Ibrahim and Musa to remind us that revelation is one continuous stream of revelation, that the Holy Quran is not introducing something that's entirely new, that the Quran is continuing a message that began with the ancient prophets. So here Allah says, وَأَنَّهُ أَهْلَكَ عَادًا الْأُولَى Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to speak about the fate of four different civilizations. The first being Ad, the second being Thamud, the third being the people of Nuh, the community of Nuh, and then finally Allah Azza wa Jal will speak to us about the fate of the community of Lut alayhi salam. وَأَنَّهُ أَهْلَكَ عَادًا الْأُولَى Now before I continue, we mentioned that these verses are a continuation of what Allah is sharing with us about what was mentioned in the scriptures of Ibrahim and Musa. And many of you know and have asked about a verse in the whole Quran where Allah says that we do not differentiate between any of the prophets. In Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 136, Allah says, لا نفرق بين أحد منه that we do not differentiate, we do not distinguish between any of these prophets. Now that doesn't mean that all of the prophets are of equal spiritual rank, but rather when the Quran says that we do not differentiate between any of them, it means that the essence of all of their messages, of all of their teachings is one. What was recorded in the scriptures of Ibrahim and Musa is being repeated now in the Holy Quran. So Allah says, and he destroyed Ad, the former. Now who is Ad? When Allah says, وَأَنَّهُ أَهْلَكَ عَادًا الْأُولَى That Allah is the one who destroyed Ad, the former. Now Ad was a pre-Islamic tribe that occupied the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. And this is a tribe that was named after the great-great-grandson of Nuh salam. They had settled in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula and they became, they flourished into a very powerful civilization. They were made up of about 12 to 13 tribes, and collectively they were known as Ad. This community, this civilization, built a magnificent city called Iran. In Surah Al Fajr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alludes to this, where He says, They built a city that had many pillars, many monuments. And they, they were able to carve out their dwellings. They were able to carve out monuments in the mountains. They had advanced technological abilities to such an extent that Allah in Surah Al-Fajr, He says, Allah in Surah Al-Fajr, He says that they were able to construct things that no one else was able to replicate. 
So again, the Quran highlights that Ad was very technologically advanced. Again, it's not easy to be able to, to carve out living spaces and buildings and residences in the mountains. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed Ad, the tribe of Ad, with many different bounties. They occupied some of the most fertile farmlands in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. So they were agriculturally advanced. They were technologically advanced. They had an they had an extremely powerful military. So they were able to defend themselves against foreign invaders. Historians say that whenever they would enter into any military conflict, they would be able to obliterate their enemies. So if you if you really look at it, Ad is very similar to some of the superpowers that we see in the world today. They have economic power, they have military power, they're technologically advanced. But Allah says, I completely destroyed them. Now, even though Ad, the tribe of Ad was, you know, they were artist, artistically advanced, technologically advanced, they had great economic and military power. But morally, they were corrupt. They were religiously, morally, ethically bankrupt. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed from among them a prophet named Hud. Hud alayhi salam came from a very prominent family within the tribe of Ad. He had, he had, a, he earned the respect of his tribesmen. He came from a very notable, very prominent family. He was known for his moral excellence. So he was very trustworthy in his community. And Hud السلام, was appointed as a prophet to awaken their conscience, to turn them back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to remind them that there's more to life than these materialistic possessions. There's more to life than money, than power, than wealth. But of course they rejected, they rebelled, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately punished them. And if you look at the Holy Quran, Allah says, عَادٌ, Allah says in Surah 69, verses 6 and 7, He speaks about how He punished them. So you find that a lot of their power came from their agriculture. So, you know, to be agriculturally advanced, you need fertile land and you need abundant rainfall. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the source of their strength to punish them. Allah says, That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them with a howling, raging wind. Allah destroyed this massive civilization with wind. And you find that wind was the source of their strength because wind was what was bringing the clouds. Wind was what was pollinating their plants and their trees. So this wind, which was the source of their economic strength, Allah uses this same natural force to destroy them for their iniquities, for their rebelliousness. And Allah says in ayah number 7 of Surah 69, He imposed upon them for seven nights and eight days consecutively. He imposed upon them for seven nights and eight days consecutively, this howling, raging wind, so that you might see the people fallen as though they were hollowed palm trunks. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely wiped them out. So again, because this is a Meccan surah, 
you the Quraysh who are the most powerful tribe in the Arabian Peninsula now Allah is reminding them of their predecessors that there was a tribe by the name of Ad that also inhabited the Arabian Peninsula and they were much more advanced than you and Allah says I completely destroyed them and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he destroyed Thamud, sparing none of them. So Ad and Thamud, when Quraysh is hearing about this, and Quraysh, you know, they were the, the main enemies of the Holy Prophet. Allah is telling them that there were powerful, there were powerful civilizations that inhabited inhabited the Arabian Peninsula before you. I sent them prophets and they rejected the prophets. They became deceived by their material strength, and I ultimately punished them. So Thamud and Ad, they were these pre-Islamic civilizations that were very formidable, but Allah says, I completely wiped them out. With Thamud, Fama Abqa. And with Thamud, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed Ad with this raging wind, with this natural disaster. And Thamud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah 51, verses 43 to 44, Wa fi Thamud, إِذْ hatta hin. Now Thamud, as many of you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them Nabi Salih, Prophet Salih. And this was the community that, you know, after hamstringing the camel, the she camel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted them three days. So after killing the she camel, which was a sign for them, Allah gave them three days to make tawbah, to repent. So the ayah says, وَفِي ثَمُودٍ وَفِي ثَمُودَ إِذْ قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَمَتَّعُوا حَتَّى حِينَ فَعَتَوْا عَنْ عَنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّهِمْ They rebelled. They were taken by a blast. Allah seized them with this blast. In Surah number 7, Allah speaks to us about how He punished the community of Ad, the people of Ad. In ayah number 78, Allah seized them with an earthquake. And they were motionless in their homes. So Allah mentions Ad and Thamud. He mentions their strength, their power. But ultimately, in the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're utterly weak and He completely wiped them out. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next ayah. So again, these verses are going to speak about four civilizations. The first was Ad. The second was Thamud, and these are both pre Islamic tribes that occupied the Arabian Peninsula. And then Allah mentions the people of Nuh. So these are some of the most rebellious nations of the past. And the people of Nuh from before. Truly, they were most wrongdoing and most rebellious. It's interesting that when Allah mentions Ad and Thamud, He doesn't mention that they were the most, you know, wicked and the most rebellious. It seems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's criticism of the people of Nuh is even more severe than His criticism of Ad and Thamud. Why is that? Because Allah says, Hum wa They were the most wrongdoing, the most rebellious, and the most wicked. Why is that? Because, brothers and sisters, it was the, it was during the time of Nuh, the community of Nuh, who established the tradition of idol worship. All idol worship can be traced back 
to the people of Nuh. So it was Qawm Nuh that introduced this concept of idol worship. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns them for this because they established this custom of idol worship and later on it was imitated by others. And we have a narration from the Holy Prophet ﷺ where he speaks about the punishment for establishing a custom, an evil custom, a sinful custom that is later imitated by others. So the Prophet in the beginning of the hadith, he says, whoever establishes a good sunnah, a good practice, and people imitate it and people follow it, you receive the reward of all of those who follow that practice. So for example, you know, if, you know, may Allah grant brother Zayn and his family a long life, if after they pass on, someone wants to continue this tradition of having tafsir classes on Wednesday nights, those who established this tradition will be partners in the reward of anyone who carries on that practice. And then conversely, the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he says, وَمَنْ سَنَّ سُنَّةً سَيِّئَةً but whoever establishes a wicked practice, a sinful custom, فَعُمِلَ بِهَا بَعْدَ A custom and a practice that is practiced after, كَانَ عَلَيْهِ وِزْرُ You will carry the burden of all of those who follow that practice until the Day of Judgment. كَانَ عَلَيْهِ وِزْرُهُ وَمِثْلُ أَوْزَارِهِمْ so all of those who follow will be sinful, but you will also carry their burden. So you will have a double load because you are the one who established that practice. And this is why in Ziyarat Ashura we read, أَسَّسَتْ أَسَاسَ الظُّلْمِ وَالْجَوْرِ عَلَيْكُمْ In Ziyarat Ashura, we ask Allah to send His la'na not just upon those who killed Imam al Hussein in Karbala, but we ask Allah to send His condemnation and His damnation and His la'na upon those who established the practice of oppressing the Ahlul Bayt. So what happened to Imam al Hussein in Karbala, those who organized Saqifa, the ones who are in Saqifa are also considered his killers because they are the ones who paved the road, who established the practice of wronging and oppressing the Ahlul Bayt. So this is why when Allah speaks about the, the people of Nuh, he says, وَقَوْمَ نُوحٍ مِنْ قَبْلُ إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا هُمْ أَظْلَمَ وَأَطْغَى They were the most wrongdoing and the most rebellious. They were the most wrongdoing because they established the tradition of idol worship that was later imitated by others. So polytheism, shirk, spread because of the community of Nuh. And therefore, any shirk that is being committed around the world today, it goes back to these individuals. And Allah says they were the most rebellious. They were not only adlam, they were also atgha. Why were they most the most rebellious? Because Allah sent them Nuh, one of his greatest messengers, one of the messengers of Ul al-Az, one of the five messengers of great resolve for 950 years. We don't have any prophet who spent this much time with his community. But after investing so much time, day and night, he was preaching to them, he was only able to recruit a small number. And in fact, they were so rebellious. If you go to Surah Nuh, ayah number 7, Allah, said, Allah quotes Nuh alayhi salam. Saying, وَإِنِّي كُلَّمَا دَعَوْتُهُمْ لِتَغْفِرَ لَهُمْ Oh Allah, whenever I invited them 
towards your forgiveness imagine how rebellious you have to be that Nuh is speaking and he's telling them that Allah is willing to forgive you and they put their fingers in their ears they don't even want to listen now it's one thing if you don't want to listen they would place their garments over their faces they would not even want to look at Nuh they were persistent in their rebelliousness. They were arrogant. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is trying to tell those who are surrounding the Prophet that don't be like Ah, don't think that you're so powerful because I've destroyed nations before you that were more powerful. Ah, they were able to build palaces and homes in the mountains. Thamud was also a powerful civilization, but there's no trace of them left because they rejected Hud and they rejected Salih. And the community of Nuh, the people of Nuh, they're also gone. Don't be rebellious towards Rasulullah as the people of Nuh were rebellious towards him. When Rasulullah speaks, listen. Don't put your fingers in your ears. Don't turn away arrogantly. Don't commit the same sins that previous nations have committed with respect to their prophets. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next ayah, He says, So the first civilization that was mentioned was Ad. Then Thamud was mentioned. And then the people of Nuh. And then number four is And he raised the overturned cities such that there covered them that which covered. Al-Mu'tafikata is a name given to the people of Lut alayhi salam. So this is a reference, these verses are understood by most commentators to be a reference to the calamities that befell the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Prophet Lut alayhi salam and they started to commit acts of sexual indecency publicly. They, were, they refused to repent. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obliterated them. Allama Tabatabai in Tafsir al Mizam, he says that the overturned cities, the cities that were subverted, because the verse says, that they were thrown down, which indicates that this was a city that was raised up and it was flung towards the earth and buried into the earth. Now, Allama Tabatabai, he suggests that the punishment meted out to the people of Lut was a volcanic eruption accompanied by three distinct phenomena. Number one, as mentioned in this surah, where Allah says, ta'ahwa, meaning that this is the overturned city that was thrown down. Because this, this is what the, this is what the, what the word wal mu'tafikata means. It was thrown down, ahwa, and the ayah says faghashaha ma gasha. It was buried. So this, this was a city that was thrown down and buried. It seems that there was some type of earthquake or some type of eruption, and the ahadith mentioned that Jibrail took the city and flipped it upside down. Now again. It, it we can easily explain this through through natural forces but Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed malaika to govern some of these natural forces these natural disasters so number one Allah tabatabai says that these are cities that were overturned so this is one description they were overturned and buried thrown down and buried Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the punishment 
given to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah as فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الصَّيْحَةُ مُشْرِقِينَ that there were explosions that produced powerful blasts and howls which is typical of a volcanic eruption and it happened to them at dawn so again you see with with all of these past nations whether it's Aad and Thamud the people of Lut you find that Allah gives them the opportunity to repent with the community of Thamud after they hamstrung the she camel the punishment didn't descend upon them immediately the adab came down after three days which means Allah still gives them the opportunity to repent the community of Lut, with all of their indecency, they would commit rape, they were sexually indecent in public forums. Allah punishes them at dawn. Why at dawn? Because He gave them the entire night to do tawbah, to repent. Allah says, فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الصَّيْحَةُ مُشْرِقِينَ مُشْرِقِينَ meaning at dawn, the place of shuruq, where the sun rises. Meaning they had the whole night to repent. The people of Nuh, when did the flood come? After 950 years, Allah gave them decades upon decades, centuries to repent. But they refused. So the punishment for the community of Lut, it was described as an overturning of their city, an explosion, a sound blast that happened at dawn. And number three, Allah Tabatabai says they were also punished with the raining down of lava and volcanic rock. So this was a very severe natural disaster in the form of a volcanic eruption that caused the entire city to be uprooted and flipped upside down. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah 11, Surah Dhud. Ayah number 82, he says, فَلَمَّا جَاءَ أَمْرُنَا When our command came, جَعَلْنَا عَالِيَهَا سَافِلَهَا We basically overturned the city. وَأَمْطَرْنَا عَلَيْهَا حِجَارَةً مِنْ سِجِّيلٍ مَنْضُودٍ And we showered them with sandstone shards, with, you know, volcanic rock. And then Allah says in the next ayah, So which of your Lord's bounties do you dispute? It's interesting, brothers and sisters, Allah shares with us the fate of these four civilizations and the, the cause of their decline goes back to one thing, their ingratitude. Ad did not appreciate the material blessings nor the spiritual blessings. Allah blessed the people of Ad and Thamud with these material comforts. He sent them Hud and Salih, but they did not appreciate the material blessings nor the spiritual blessings. The community of Nuh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon them affluence. He blessed them. They had wealth. They were living a prosperous life. He sends them one of his greatest messengers. They didn't appreciate. They didn't appreciate the, the material nourishment that they were being provided, nor the spiritual nourishment in the form of guidance. The people of Lut as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided them lawful ways to channel their sexual desires. But they refused. He sent them Lut alayhi salam. Lut offered them his daughters. But they refused. So their sins all go back to this ingratitude. This lack of appreciation for Allah's blessings. There's a hadith from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa where he speaks about the danger of taking Allah's blessings for granted, whether they are material blessings or spiritual blessings. 
The hadith says, ثَلَاثٌ مِّنَ الذُّنُوبِ تُعَجِّلُ عُقُوبَتُهَا وَلَا تُؤَخَّرْ إِلَى الْآخِرَةِ there are three types of sins whereby the punishment is expedited in this life and it is not delayed until the hereafter. Some sins you commit and you'll pay the price in the akhirah. But there are other sins where no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes you in this life. It's expedited. The Holy Prophet says, ثَلَاثٌ مِّنَ الذُّنُوبِ تُعَجِّلُ عُقُوبَتُهَا وَلَا تُؤَخَّرْ إِلَى الْآخِرَةِ Number one is عُقُوقُ الْوَالِدَيْنِ Mistreating your parents. My dear brothers and sisters, respecting your parents and honoring them and being dutiful to your parents is so important that disrespecting them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even wait until after death. The punishment happens in this life. And we all have stories. We've all seen people who have mistreated their parents. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals very severely with them. The Holy Prophet says, disrespecting your parents, abusing them, being harsh towards them. Allah doesn't delay that punishment. This is a punishment that is expedited in this life you'll taste the punishment in some way, in some form. Number two is, nas. If you hurt people, if you transgress, if you infringe on people's rights, the punishment will happen in this life. And number three, وَكُفْرُ الْإِحْسَانِ To be ungrateful for the goodness that you see in your life. To be unthankful. To be ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll experience the punishment in this life. Now, when Allah says, Allah mentions the fate, the awful fate of Ad, of Thamud, of the people of Nuh, the people of Lut. So you may ask me, why is Allah saying, you know, so which of your Lord's bounties will you dispute? You, I mean, you would think there was no mention of bounties. Allah spoke about how he destroyed past civilizations. Some of the Mufassireen, they say that Rasulullah because he is the declared mercy to the world, as Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ that the Holy Prophet is a mercy to the world. That the Prophet was a mercy to the, even the disbelievers, even to his enemies he was a mercy. Because the enemies of Rasulullah did not experience the same type of destruction that the enemies of previous prophets experienced. Look at what happened to those who were the enemies of Salih. Of Ah, of uh, Hud, of Nuh, Allah Azza wa completely wiped out the opponents of previous prophets. He destroyed civilizations because of their rebelliousness. The Ummah of Rasulullah, the enemies of the Prophet, they were not destroyed in the same way that the people of Lut were destroyed. They were not destroyed in the same way as the people of Nuh. Why? Because of the position of the Holy Prophet. That Rasulullah is such a blessing, he's such a, mercy, such a mercy to humanity, that even those who reject him will not be punished, at least in this life, with the same type of destruction that previous nations experienced. Allah then says, هَذَا نَذِيرٌ مِّنَ النُّذُرِ الْأُولَى this is a warning from the warning from the warners of old. Now, Hada Nadir warning here either could be a reference to the Prophet, because some of the Mufassirin of the Quran they say that one of the names of the Prophet, one of the titles of the Prophet in the Quran is Nadir. Inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira. 
The prophet is not just a bearer of glad tidings, but he's a warner. He's there to warn the sinners, to warn those who are heedless. And others say that it's the Quran. This is a warning, meaning the Quran is a warning. In the same way that the scriptures of Ibrahim and of Musa were warnings, the Holy Quran is also a warning that is echoing the warning that was mentioned in previous scriptures. And some commentators have said that this is a warning, meaning the fate of those four civilizations that reflecting upon what happened to Ad, to Thamud, to the people of Nuh, to the people of Lut, this is a warning that don't follow in their footsteps. Don't be rebellious. Don't take Allah's blessings for granted. And then Allah says, Azifatil Azifa. The imminent is near. The word Azafa refers to limited time. And the idea here is that there is a very limited time left until the day of judgment. You know, the idea that the Day of Judgment is drawing near is a common theme in the Holy Qur'an. In fact, there are some verses in the Qur'an where Allah says explicitly, that the hour has drawn near. The Day of Judgment is very close, that we should not consider the Day of Qiyamah as some distant event that will happen in the distant future. In fact, one of the signs of the end of times is the advent of Rasulullah Which means what? If we say that the emergence of Rasulullah is a signal that the day of judgment is close, that means that the time remaining after the Prophet is less than the time that has passed before the Prophet. If the advent of Rasulullah is one of the signs of the coming of the Day of Judgment, it means that the time period between Adam and Rasulullah is greater than the time period between Rasulullah and the Day of Qiyamah. Because otherwise it wouldn't make sense to say that the advent of the Prophet is a sign of the Day of Judgment. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi he says, That me and the final hour are like these two fingers, meaning that they're very close to each other. And Rasulullah began his prophetic mission 14 centuries ago. So we're now even closer to the day of Qiyam. So again, we always need to remind ourselves that Yawm Al-Qiyamah is not some distant reality. It's not something that's going to happen in the distant future. The Qur'an says, اقتربت الساعة 14 centuries ago. So we have to remind ourselves of the transient nature of this earthly life. That time is running out. This life is passing. And then Allah says, ليس لها من دون الله كاشفة. It, meaning the Day of Judgment, has no unveiler apart from God. Now here, Kashifa can have two meanings. Kashifa either means that it is only Allah who unveils the Day of Judgment, meaning He's the only one that knows when it will take place, and He's the only one who has the ability to, to, to bring it to pass. So kashifa here means that Allah is the only one who is the unveiler of the Day of Judgment with respect to its time. He's the only one that knows the time of the Day of Qiyamah. And he's the only one who is able to bring it to pass. Others have said that Laysa, Laysa laha min dunillahi kashifa. There is no one other than Allah, according to some, who can repel the evil of that day, the difficulty of that day. You know, when we say, So this idea of kashifa means to repel 
the hardships of that day. Only Allah Azza wa Jal. This is a day that's imminent. And only Allah can repel the difficulties of that day. In Surah Al-A'raf, ayah number 187, Allah says, an sa'a." They ask you, O Muhammad, about the hour, meaning the day of judgment, the day of resurrection. Ayana mursah, when will it take place? Qul, say to them, O Muhammad, innama ilmuha inda rabbi. Its knowledge is exclusively with my Lord. No one, no angel, no prophet, no messenger knows the timing of the day of Qiyamah except Allah. La yujalliha li waqtiha illa huwa. No one can manifest it. No one can bring it to pass except Him. Then in the next verse, Allah says, أَفَمِنْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ تَعْجَبُونَ Do you then marvel at this discourse? Now here, hadith most likely is a reference to the idea that the Day of Judgment is drawing closer. أَفَمِنْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ تَعْجَبُونَ Are you surprised that this day is approaching, that the Day of Judgment is near? Are you surprised that there will be a day of accountability, that you will be called to question for everything that you've done. And do you laugh and not weep while you stand with head held high? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you, you laugh, you mock this idea of the day of judgment. While in reality you should cry, you should weep over this day of accountability. And you, you have your head held up high in arrogance, completely heedless of what is to come. There's a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen, salawatullahi alayhi. It's a, very, it's a very frightening tradition where the Imam alayhi salam, he says, لَوْ تَعْلَمُ الْبَهَائِمُ مِنَ الْمَوْتِ مَا يَعْلَمُ بْنُ آدَمْ مَا أَكَلْتُمْ مِنْهَا سَمِينَا Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says if the cattle, you know the sheep, the, the cows, the cattle, if cattle knew what you know about what will happen after death, about barzakh, about the day of Qiyamah, you would not find any heavy livestock. Meaning that if animals, if cattle, if livestock, if the cows, if these animals knew what you know about the Day of Judgment, about what will transpire after death, you would not come across a single animal that is fat. Why? Because they will lose weight because of the anxiety and the stress of thinking about that day. لو تعلم البهائم من الموت ما يعلم ابن آدم ما أكلت منها سمينا. If these animals knew what you know, you would not come across any fat cattle because of the stress of that day. And then the final ayah, and again this ayah is one of the fifteen verses in the Quran. Where Allah commands us to prostrate. 11 of them are recommended, and four of them are obligatory. And this is one of the verses of Azaim, whereby it's mandatory to prostrate after I recite it. So, inshallah, you know, after I recite the verse, you can make that sajda. Where Allah says, Wasjudu lillahi wa'budu. So prostrate to God and worship. And it's a very beautiful way of ending the, the surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the day of judgment and about nations who rejected the notion of the day of judgment and hereafter. And here the command is to prostrate. 
Allah was speaking to us about nations who were arrogant. One of the best remedies to arrogance is to prostrate, to put your face on the earth. Because the earth reminds you of your origin. And it also reminds you of your final destination, death. And it also reminds you that from this earth, Allah Azza wa Jal will resurrect you for the day of judgment. And the only way to succeed and to attain salvation on the day of judgment is through what? Through ubudiyah. Where Allah says, Wa'abudu, and be obedient and worship your Lord. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. This concludes the tafsir of Surah An Najm. Inshallah, next week, with the help of Allah Azza wa Jal, we'll commence with the tafsir of Surah At Tawbah, I believe, Surah number nine. And inshallah, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give us the tawfiq to begin that uh, that endeavor. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al